good evening or good morning, wherever you may be. Today, I'd like to talk to you about creativity in programming and in writing software more generally. The artwork here in the background is created by a deep learning model called a generative adversarial network. It's in the style of the Starry Night, which is a post-impressionist painting by Van Gogh. Ah, all right, I'm going to uh, try that again. Um, <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'll try that again. Is that live? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Good. So, creativity for the purpose of this presentation is generating ideas or solutions that are novel and preferably useful. This interesting image is novel to me, so I find it interesting. I don't know if it's useful, but I suppose I'm using it right now, so to that degree it's useful. So usefulness is one benchmark you can apply to define something as creative, as opposed to uninspiring art or trivial ramblings or bad ideas for inventions that won't work. So. Here's the structure. Part one, I'm going to tell you about the craft of, or the art of programming and of software more generally. In part two, I'm going to describe some research into human creativity and what conditions engender it and how to foster it. Part three is about automation and the effects of automation on the march of progress of our civilization and where this is taking us. And in part four, I'll describe some thoughts about vocation on the idea that we all have inside us a calling which we can tap into for a more fulfilling life. Creativity is an important part of nurturing and listening to that calling. So part one. This is an illustration of Ada Lovelace. She was the first girl in tech. <laughs> In some ways, she was the first computer programmer 100 years before a computer was ever created. She was a mathematician and a brilliant thinker. She teamed up with Charles Babbage. And they had a, a long working relationship over many years, writing letters to each other about the theoretical possibilities in Babbage's difference engine, which was a theoretical instrument, the first conception of a general purpose computer. Ada Lovelace generalized Babbage's concept and recognized that the invention was was actually more powerful than he realized at first. Uh, it could handle arbitrary letters and strings, not just numbers. And the two of them worked together and refined each other's ideas. And Ada was the first to postulate, for example, that uh, looping constructs could be used in computer programs. And of course, loops are essential nowadays for every kind of programming. I recommend this recent biography by Walter Isaacson, uh, who's my favorite biographer. Uh, it's called The Innovators. It describes Ada Lovelace's story very well. The second book there, pictured on the bottom right, is a widely acclaimed biographical novel. In other words, it's a work of fiction, but with a historical basis about Ada Lovelace's life. Now, some terminology first. Cross, so software engineering is really a cross-disciplinary field it involves programming as one part. I'd use the terms programming and coding interchangeably in this talk. So I think of programming as being quite a different exercise than the broader concept of software engineering. Programming itself is more like solving this Rubik's cube. It's an abstract puzzle solving problem. It can be quite mathematical. It's really about how to design abstract concepts to allow a particular problem to be solved. So I'm not going to focus on software engineering, the broader concept, much in this presentation. But, but briefly, it, it involves several phases that, that can be creative endeavors by themselves. There's user experience design, which is pictured in the top left, the programming or implementation side of it. Uh, then there's testing and documentation and maintenance and so on. Okay, so some people will find some of these aspects to be creative and others will not. 
Okay, so it depends on the person. Okay, but I, I won't focus much on this. Software isn't really like this bridge. Okay. Engineers try to build reliable things. And so engineering often starts with a concept of a, an overall overarching goal with a series of phases that takes projects through requ requirements gathering and then building a prototype and then perhaps um, going on to start implementation once the requirements have been gathered and then a testing phase after that and so on. But Many people in software will recognize that no matter how carefully you plan a program, your plans will turn out to be imperfect. Sometimes the only way to know what needs to be built is to actually try building it. And in the process of building it, you can discover more about the problem itself. So programming is more like this, so more like the um, application of a scientific method really here. So here's, um. Uh, a picture of Rosalind Franklin, who did much of the seminal work on the discovery of DNA through X-ray crystallography. So she produced a lot of the data hinting that the structure was a double helix. She unfortunately didn't receive the recognition she deserved for her work in her lifetime. She died of cancer in her late 1930s, or in her late 30s, due to the, the X-rays um, from her experiments. So, but she would have been a strong contender for the Nobel Prize for the discovery of DNA that went to Watson and Crick. Um, so programming is like science in that it, it requires not just um, application of the scientific method, but some kind of spark of intuition or discovery. Okay, So it's the discovery element that's important. And for that reason, a bottom-up design can work better than a top-down design. Here's another book reference. So Rosalind Franklin's contributions are described well by the same biography, but biographer Walter Isaacson uh, in this recent book called Codebreaker. It's about genetic engineering and the people who've been involved in pushing that field forward, particularly Jennifer Doudna, who's pictured here. I'd now like to focus on the joys and then the woes of coding. And this list of five joys and then Five Woes is a summary from a book by Fred Brooks, who was the person in charge of building the IBM 360 mainframe computer. Uh, and he was a professor of computer science. So he wrote a book in 1975 with timeless wisdom. The only thing that's not timeless about the book is the, the gender bias and the title. <laughs> okay, so first up, there's the joy, the sheer joy of making things, just like the child delights in making a mud pie. <laughs> the second is the pleasure of making things that are useful to other people. Deep within, we want others to use our work and find it helpful. Third, there's the, the puzzle solving fascination, um, fashioning puzzle-like objects into some arrangement Ooh, uh, that broke. I'm going to try that again. Um, yeah, to, um, okay, um, so that they can work to solve a problem together. So like the Rubik's Cube I put, uh, showed you before. And there are many similar sorts of intellectual puzzles involved in different aspects of programming. So fourth is the joy of always learning. I think this is because the, the task of programming isn't one that repeats in the same way ever. Uh, in one way or another, the problem is always new. And as you solve it, you always learn something, sometimes practical or sometimes theoretical, or sometimes both. And finally, there's the, the delight in, in working with uh, the imagination. So abstract creations of the imagination. So it's a very tractable medium. Um, much more so than, than a paintbrush or any other medium. Uh, so it's, it's really the pure realm of thought. So much like poetry in that sense, it's, it's only very slightly removed from, from pure thought itself. Okay. Um, but uh, unlike the poet's words, uh, the program you produce can move or work or do something, uh, produce visible outputs, it can print results or draw pictures, produce sounds, it can move arms of robots, and so on. 
Now, the way Fred Brooks puts it is that the magic one types <laughs> uh, with a, yeah, an incantation on the keyboard uh, then sort of yeah, causes the display to come to life and certain things to happen that have never happened before. So in summary, I think programming is fun because it gratifies creative longings deep within us. But not everything is delightful. Uh, so just like every other art form or craft form, there are difficulties in it. And the first of those is that you have to perform perfectly. If you've got a single bracket or other symbol in the wrong place, uh, then your, your program won't run at all. If, uh, if Fred Brooks puts it this way, if a single element of the magic incantation isn't in its perfect form, then the magic doesn't work. Um, so perhaps the most difficult part of learning to program is, is adjusting to the requirement to perform perfectly. Because uh, most fields of human endeavor don't require the same degree of perfection. Uh, the next is that uh, finding <laughs> nitty bugs is just work. Okay, whereas designing grand concepts is lots of fun. So as with any other creative activity, uh, there are sort of dreary hours of painstaking labor sometimes involved. And the third woe is really the flip side of programming having a practical utility in a way that poetry, for example, doesn't. Uh, what you've worked so hard to create is perhaps obsolete as soon as you create, uh, as soon as you complete it, or perhaps even before. Uh, there are competitors and colleagues in hot pursuit of new and better ideas. And, and the way Brooks puts it, uh, the displacement of, of your, uh, your thought child is not only conceived, but scheduled. All right. Now, this is a, a seminal work, perhaps the defining treatise of the profession of computer science uh, called The Art of Computer Programming. I just wanted to draw your attention to the term art in the title. It's, it's not, a, not a, um, an accident. So there is a, a beauty possible in programming. Uh, in mathematics, um, beauty is, is strived for. It's, it, usually the term elegance is used. It's the same really. So there's an aesthetic. Um, and in programming, that beauty is really through, through minimalism. That's the aesthetic. You could say the same about mathematics, probably. So granted, a program has to work. It has to produce the correct output. But beyond that, pro what programmers strive for is minimalism, a minimum of coding complexity to solve a problem and also a minimum of time and space and memory required to run it. And so this is similar to the way industrial designers strive to reduce the number of parts in their machines. It's worth asking this question about open source software. Why do millions of people donate their time building software for free? Software is known to be a financially rewarding industry and software development is known to be a rewarding career. So why do people donate their time? In my opinion, it's fun. It's, it, that's why, it's because it's fun to create software and it's fun to interact with others in the process. There are some initial thoughts about this matter collected in this book pictured on the left, which I recommend. It's, it was published by O'Reilly in 1999 to open sources, Voices from the Revolution. Uh, it's a collection of interviews and essays from the people involved in open source software at the time. Some of those authors mentioned that sometimes open source developers wish to scratch their own itch. Uh, that's a term that's sometimes used. Uh, but that's not a full explanation, I think, of, of why people go to great effort to publish their software and also to write high quality documentation and make it known to others by speaking about it at conferences and painstakingly fixing bugs that other people report and so on. So I think it's much more than, than that. I think it's because it's, it's an enjoyable activity. Many of the best open source projects in the world start out as hobbies, but they don't all end up that way. Corporate interests get involved and offers of corporate sponsorship become not just possible, but probable for very successful projects. But I think the genesis of most projects is still the hacker 
perhaps stereotyped as the teenager in the bedroom or or a lone inventor in a in a garage who just wants to create something because they can. This leads on to part two about human creativity. There's an interesting book here by Dorothy Sayers. She was mostly an author of crime and mystery novels, but she wrote this book. It's really an ecclesiastical treatise. Uh, it's, um, in her view, human creativity is, is a mirror of the divine creation we're all part of. Very interesting book, and she describes these three stages of creativity. So first, there's the idea applied to programming. That would be, yeah, the, the idea that of the the program as it's first born as an ideal construct in the mind of the author. Second, it's implemented. It could be realized in time and space with a pen or in silicon, in the case of programming. And, and third is the interaction between the author and, and, and the person who runs the program or, or reads a book. Okay, so the interaction with the mind of the maker. And uh, this is related to, to this topic of um, human creativity. I, I complained to my wife about the, uh, about <laughs> that if I'd need, if I wanted to pr pronounce um, this name properly, I'd need to remove part of my tongue. <laughs> but my, my, like the alien in the Simpsons. But my wife replied, um, that no, I just needed to remove some of my ignorance about about uh, European languages like Hungarian. So, um, so Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi wrote Flow and is best known for Flow, published in 1990. But this is a more recent book. He published it six years later. It discusses common elements to highly creative people across a range of industries, and I'll be drawing on this heavily for for this part of the talk. Okay, so he's done some very, very thorough research, interviewing a large number of highly creative people in detail across many fields about the creative process and summarizing it for us. And here are some of his conclusions. First, uh, frame this as a question. Why are these trees so tall? It's a similar question to why are there clusters of creative people, clusters of creativity through history? Why are these trees so tall? These trees are in a rainforest near where I live, in the Dandenongs in Victoria, Australia. And they're tall partly because they are just a tall species of tree, genetically disposed to being tall. But they're also tall partly because only the tallest trees get enough sunlight, and they're in competition with so many tall trees around them. So both nature and nurture are important here. The same elements are true, say, are present in, in hotbeds of creativity and innovation. So here are two examples of centers of artistic excellence through history. In Florence, in the early part of the 15th century, there was an amazing flourishing of high quality works of art and sculpture and architecture in the Florentine Renaissance till about 1425. And what was it about that period and, and that, that city that, that caused such a, a staggering number of amazing works of art to be produced? And what was it about Paris in the 1800s or or New York in the late 1900s in the art scene. Likewise, Bell Labs has produced a, a staggering amount of technological innovation. So here is a list of some of their in inventions, starting with the, the transistor, and the foundation of all modern computing, along with many other breakthroughs underlying the, um, particularly the digital communications we have today. So that is explored in particular in, in this book, which is which I've not read, but it's on my to-do list. And I came across this while doing the research for this talk. So I put this, this up. Uh, in biological sciences, there are other hotbeds of innovation like this one called Spring Harbor Lab in New York State. So what are the common elements for creativity for these, these hotbeds of innovation? First of all, fervent collaboration helps. Creativity at its best isn't really the result of a lone genius. So it can help to have 
people with experience in a range of disciplines, uh, a range of ideas to solve some of the problems that come along in science and technology. Or in the case of the art, to have people who have experience in other art forms and be able to absorb those ideas into one's own field of art. In other words, to do your best work, you need to be around other people doing great work. And an important component of this is, is about judgment and evaluation, which is necessary to filter your creative work from your uncreative work. Um, so criticism and, and judgment might receive a bad rap, but they are uh, to, be, to be valued, <laughs> to, be, um, to be sought after. Uh, if you want to do your best work. Now, here are some personal notes. Um, I've had periods when I've been in creative flow mode, um, in, involved in, in research and also in programming. And, and I think um, here are some signs that you're in creative flow mode. First of all, you, you won't want to stop doing what you're doing. Uh, you may keep going with it, even though you think you should be doing other things. And I put should here in quotes. Okay, so there's a, an intrinsic motivation for it as well. Now, some studies have shown that intrinsic motivation is important for creative flow. Uh, for, so for example, people have been offered a financial reward for doing certain creative tasks, and that has been shown to make them less creative or less able to do the task, which is interesting. Um, but on the other hand, much, much innovation has been uh, fueled by, by a desire to be rewarded fairly for good work. And I think that's, um, I think it's important that you feel worthy of accepting financial rewards uh, rather than pushing that away. Uh, so I think um, even if there's an extrinsic motivation, the, if, you, if you love what you do, the intrinsic motivation will 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 carry carry you through the the difficult um the difficult periods in that creativity here's an image from pinocchio from disney's 1940 film uh, of geppetto's workshop okay so geppetto was the wood carver he ran a, a toy shop during the day and and he he was working at night on carving out pinocchio little boy made of wood. Um, so his light was on late at night when the rest of the, the town was asleep. It can be a bit like this with programming or other creative endeavors. I think it's partly due to the creative flow which happens and it doesn't really feel like work, so people just keep going. Um, and it's partly also perhaps to minimize interruptions, so the practical reason that perhaps Geppetto is you know, serving his customers in his toy shop during the day and didn't have enough time to work on his creation and he's doing it at night um, and also doing something creative i think gives you energy so there are several factors at work here um, my um, experience as well is that i've sometimes found it natural to work late into the night when i'm in a period of flow because it can feel like every interruption can halve my output <laughs> um, or more positively say that when you're in flow, working on a hard problem, um, every uninterrupted hour can double your productivity. Here's a quote from Charles Darwin. The mere consciousness of an engagement will sometimes worry a whole day. Okay. So paraphrased, having a single meeting scheduled can interrupt a whole day's work, because it divides the day into two chunks, each of which is too small to actually solve a hard problem in. So what does this mean? Does it mean creative people are loners by necessity? No, it doesn't. There are two different modes of operation. It's important to be aware of. There's maker mode and manager mode. And this is summarized well in a blog post by Paul Graham called Maker Schedule, Manager Schedule. Um, Paul Graham was is the founder of Y Combinator. So even creative people need to enter manager mode sometimes to survive. Um, now, but first of all, in maker mode, we, we like uninterrupted flow. This works best. Meetings are 
uh, to be avoided. <laughs> uh, creative bursts happen sometimes without us needing many breaks, but even breaks spark new ideas for us. Whereas in manager mode, it's all about scheduling. It's about prioritizing. It's about delegating. It's about leading a team, you know, strategic decisions and hiring and so on. There tend to be, um, yeah, I suppose people in manager mode tend to have more power in organizations and their underlings are often expected to skip and dance to manage schedules. Um, managers tend to accomplish most of their work through other people. So a, a manager's work is mostly involved in meetings or communication with other people. Okay, so it's natural for a manager to divide a day into chunks of time, like one hour. But for a creative person in maker mode, that um, that's that's very disruptive. So each of these different modes of work is fine by itself. The problem is that sometimes the two schedules clash. And when a manager isn't aware of the cost of meetings on a creative person, this can lead to frustration. So this leads on to, on to automation as a topic. Okay. So programming is really the latest step or computers allow the latest step in automation. But automation has been going uh, gone for, so particularly in the industrial revolution, we've had um, great advances in the way we, we can form our agriculture, for example. So um, for most of human history, most of our activities were ensuring we had enough to eat. And still today, agriculture is very manual and labor intensive. But in the last 150 years in particular, there's been uh, a lot of automation with machines like this tractor and combine harvester, which allow us to feed far more people with the same amount of human effort and land use. Here's a family bathing and washing clothes in a river in Andhra Pradesh in India. Uh, so nearly 5 billion people out of the world's population of about 8 billion still hand wash their clothes. And even in the developed world, until the late 1920s to 1940s, most laundry was done by hand. So until very, very recently, so laundering clothes for a typical family would take most of one day per week called laundry day. <laughs> Um, and this was a burden usually borne by the women, soaking, beating, scrubbing, rinsing dirty clothes and sheets. Here's a modern miracle. The one pictured on the left is a, an electric washing machine from Miele uh, in 1923. Okay, so <laughs> um, electric washing machines look quite different now. They've come a long way, but just even that recently, uh, that was a research prototype. <laughs> um, Irish feminist Mary Frances MacDonald has described washing machines as the single most life-changing invention for women. And Hans Rosling, a Swedish demographer, says washing machines are the greatest invention of the Industrial Revolution. One interesting thing about labor-saving technology in the home is that it doesn't even lead to that scale of creative destruction of jobs described by Marx and Schumpeter. Okay, it's, it, it's taking away work that was internalized within a home. Um, here's a, a photo of one of the computing groups at NASA at its Jet Propulsion Lab in around 1955. These people here are the computers. The original computers were humans. They had some simple devices to help them but essentially they were doing the computing themselves. In the top photo are some of the mathematicians and computers who worked at NASA around this time or a little later in the early 1960s. And the bottom photo is of Mary Jackson, who's the subject of a book and film called Hidden Figures, um, which came out recently. Um, so that was her, presumably around 1965, once mainframe computers were available at NASA to help with automating previously manual calculations. 
here's the the book and the drama film from 2016 it's uh, both of these are about African-American female mathematicians who worked at NASA during the space race. Here's a question. Do you enjoy cooking? Is it a joy or a chore for you? Do you enjoy cooking for others? What about cooking for yourself? If you do enjoy cooking, I expect that's because of the creativity possible in it and the enjoyment of making something that others appreciate. So it's the desire to create and the desire to serve. Here's a robot that cooks. It's a video. I'll try to launch this now. That didn't work. That didn't work either. All right, well, that's fine. So it's it's from a company called Moly Robotics in London. It has some human-like hands from the shadow robot company. Uh, they can grasp and stir and so on. And it behaves just like a regular chef would. The company teamed up with a BBC Master Chef winner who made several thousand dishes wearing special sensor gloves. The gloves recorded the exact pattern of movements and can replay them. And so the robot has a big hard disk with lots of recipes recorded on it. And you can buy one of these kitchen robots now, I believe. They cost roughly $20,000, perhaps a bit more. But the price will be coming down one day. And so some people like cooking. Uh, for those people who whom it's a chore, it would be uh, uh, fun to have a um, some more domestic help in the form of robots. <laughs> okay, and one final point about automation is I enjoy running, even though I own a car. So it's having choices is what automation grants us, and that's powerful. Here's an illustration about automation by Kai Fu Li, who is a Taiwanese born American computer scientist and businessman. And he worked on automatic speech recognition for his PhD at Carnegie Mellon, and then worked as an executive at Apple and Microsoft. And uh, he was the president of Google China for a few years. Um, he, so he's here he placed various jobs on a spectrum, in his opinion, from repetitive to creative. We might think about, about another axis. So, so like where, how much creativity does your, job require or how much compassion or empathy does it require in the vertical axis? See there? So if we if we think about it this way, um, we we can probably make our own placements of what we know about different different jobs and how much empathy or compassion they require on the vertical axis and or and how much creativity or strategy they require, or rather sort of optimization to do some, a repetitive task quickly and reliably on, um, as we're going left. So we can then come up with a kind of Cartesian coordinate system for this. And Kai Fu Li's assessment is this, that those jobs in the bottom left quadrant, which are repetitive, where empathy or compassion are not needed, are those that will be replaced by AI soonest. Those in the bottom right will involve a blend of AI and, and human. Uh, those in the top will require people, uh, so those where empathy and compassion are needed. Um, if the job isn't particularly creative, then uh, the, the diagram in the top left with the human uh, as a circle around the AI indicates that uh, there'll be some AI involved in automating this, and the, but the humans will ultimately provide the care. So, for example, for aged care work or, um, or other fields, perhaps, um, perhaps teaching and so on. So there'll be some automation possible, um, but humans will make use of that AI. Uh, and in the fourth uh, quadrant of uh, the top right, he thinks it'll be mostly human with a little bit of AI helping. So I broadly agree with this assessment. Um, there's an interesting uh, TED talk you might like to see. It's called How AI Can Save Our Humanity. Now, um, on that topic of saving our humanity, well, 
I'd like to discuss vocation. So this calling, I believe we all have to be creative and to do something that serves others. There's an interesting book here by um, an Australian lady named Bronnie Ware. She worked in palliative care, supporting terminally ill patients in their last 12 weeks of life. And the, she wrote a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. This is the number one regret that her patients expressed. Okay, so she felt she heard many stories from people um, that express, expressed regrets about what they had or had not done with their life. And she wrote these down. So the number one regret was, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. This could be interpreted as, as, as a calling to do more creative work or more, more empathetic work, the kind of work that is a more unique reflection of each person's true nature. So I believe this, inside each of us is a calling to make a creative difference. Nobody wants to believe that they're born for a life of drudgery. And I'm optimistic that once the mundane tasks are stripped away, we have more machines and computers working to help us with chores, we can devote more of our precious time to being loving and creative. So that I think is the value of automation for humanity. Computers follow rules blindly, so you can be creative. I don't think humanity is served by people doing mundane tasks they don't enjoy. And humanity needs all the creativity we can muster to solve hard, important problems like how to live within the limits of our small, fragile biosphere. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, gave a commencement address to Stanford. He, he said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. You have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. If you haven't seen this video, I highly recommend it. It was recorded. It's about vocation or calling. Steve Jobs called it your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. So his message was, you've got to find what you love. But this other message of, of being able to connect the dots looking backward, here's an example of that. Gauss wrote in his lifetime, mathematics is the queen of the sciences and number theory is the queen of mathematics. This is a statement about the intrinsic motivation of the early number theorists. They did it because their creative instincts led them to this work on number theory. They found it beautiful. Here's another quote by another number theorist, Leonard Dixon, with a similar point. He wrote, thank God that number theory is unsullied by any application. But nowadays, number theory is hopelessly useful. The book on the left is a summary of applications of number theory in science and communication. So particularly since cryptography became important in the 1940s, and since computers were built in the 1950s. The early number theorists followed their vacation, their vocation that they probably couldn't foresee all of the future applications and they didn't live to see them. Um, only we can see these connections looking backwards with the hindsight of history about what was once a, uh, the purest, least applicable discipline in all of the sciences and is now used in cryptography, coding, information theory, quantum mechanics, quantum computing, and wireless communications, and every aspect of computer science. So there's an exercise I'd like to recommend you do after, after this presentation. List your childhood interests and projects. I'll give an example. Here were my childhood interests. I was interested in Lego as a young kid. I liked playing the piano. I took lessons for a long time and I enjoyed that. I also look, took lessons in the violin, but I didn't really enjoy that as much. It didn't really spark the same intrinsic motivation in me. So I've just listed piano. I liked playing computer games. 
I tried writing some of my own games too. I liked playing chess. I, I liked judo and I did a lot of judo competitively. And I did some other sports competitively, which I enjoyed too. They were fun. Swimming, basketball, rugby, athletics, track. I did computer programming as well. And I'll describe the crossel in the next slide. And I enjoyed reading. Okay, so those are some of the things I enjoyed most. Now, crossel, what is crossel? This is a list of words in the page of a magazine called the Australian Women's Weekly magazine. The magazine ran a competition every month for decades with prize money. You see there's a little faded diagram in the bottom left corner here of a sample entry. So the goal was to take these words and to arrange them on a small grid to maximize the score you could. And the person with the highest score each month was awarded a prize. This is a scan that I found online from an, from a, an edition of this magazine in 1959. Uh, and see, there was a 500 pound prize. This is before Australia uh, uh, lost its, uh, well, it stopped using pound sterling as its currency. So um, 500 pounds was a lot of money in 1959. <laughs> uh, I found out about this as a teenager. A friend of my mother's tipped me off to this, and and I thought I might try my hand at this. Uh, by then, the prize money was up to two thousand uh, dollars, and that was each month that, that was available. So that I was, uh, I thought that would be a princely sum for me as a as a teenager. Um, so so I tried to program a solution. I, I thought a computer might be able to help me win this prize. I I wrote program using the only language I knew, which was basic at the time, and it was fine, it worked, uh, but it was a bit too slow. So I had to think about how to do this better. Now, just to give you another sense of this, here's a rather fuzzy image of how people might have done it in the 80s with bits of paper. The other way would have been to just kind of write letters on a grid. Okay, the goal was to kind of put the words on a grid to maximize the score. Uh, but human scores turned out to be quite hard to beat. I, I ran my, my basic program for a whole month. <laughs> it just uh, sort of warmed up the room quite a lot where the computer was running. And by the end of the month, um, uh, my scores were okay, but they weren't as good as previous winners. So I sent a submission, but I, I didn't win it. Um, here's a, another perhaps clearer view. This is more modern. So this is, uh, yeah, it's been printed out, but the goal is to kind of take these bits of paper and, and stick them on here. Um, so you can sort of maximize the score. And once you've done it, you send in your entry. Okay. Um, there, so there are around a hundred words each month you can pull from. Um, so because my, my original program was too slow, I learned the C programming language, which I'd heard was much faster. And it did run much faster, about 100 times faster. But it was still too slow. It ran for a month and my scores still weren't high enough. Uh, they were not bad, a little bit higher, but they weren't going to win me that prize money. So I tried some approximations and that helped. Um, but my final years of schooling were coming up and I, I put this project aside until my exams were over. And after they were over, I looked around for this again, but I discovered that that year the magazine had stopped running the Crosal competition after running it for decades. They'd run it for the last time. So I never won my $2,000 prize money. <laughs> but this project did teach me that computers were not fast enough to solve most interesting problems with brute force. And this led directly to, to an interest in AI, which became my PhD topic. Uh, it turns out that the, the search problem crops up in many fields, including automatic speech recognition. Here's a visualization of a search tree um, for the game tic-tac-toe um, using what's called Monte Carlo tree search. You can see there's this sort of combinatorial explosion of 
of possibilities uh, when the branching factor is, is high enough and the, the, the tree gets deep, it, it just sort of becomes uh, the, the number of possibilities that a computer would have to search over by brute force is, becomes in, just overwhelming, more than the uh, number of atoms in the known universe. Um, so there's a range of complexity of games from tic-tac-toe in the top left to, to go, which is considered to be one of the hardest human games um, in the sense that the depth of the search tree is, is greatest. Okay, so um, computers could beat humans at chess uh, by around, I think, the, the 1990s when Deep Blue beat Kasparov, uh, but the same wasn't true in Go until just about three or four years ago when um, a, uh, a, a, a deep reinforcement learning technique from a company called DeepMind, which Google purchased, um, um, yeah, managed to to write a, an algorithm for Go. Anyway, this visualization on the bottom right is a um, it's stochastic gradient descent, which is one of the techniques that's useful for um, for training deep learning models. Okay, so here are some takeaways. If you're creative. You can probably do more if you if you can expand your powers to make use of programming. You can probably do more uh, interesting and new and creative things with what you're already creative with. So programming might open up your potential for new possibilities in your field. This interesting picture of a cat is in the, the style of um, the self-portrait of um, Vincent van Gogh, um, the post-impressionist painter. Uh, so learning a foreign language doesn't make you creative, but it does allow you to express an infinite variety of ideas to other people with that language. Uh, likewise, learning a programming language lets you express an infinite variety of ideas for computers to do your bidding. If you do want to learn coding, realize that it's not just useful. <laughs> um, and I'd encourage you to find the creativity in it. Get curious. The mental game of coding is, is fun and can be beautiful. Uh, find this fun for yourself when you're learning. So challenge yourself to play with interesting projects, the projects that interest you personally, uh, especially if others think they're trivial. <laughs> and last, if you want to be more creative, Try to reconnect with your inner child. What inspired you as a child? What did your parents have to stop you from doing? And play with your ideas. Uh, um, and play with other people as well. You can test your ideas or your craft with them. Learn from others and expose your ideas to them. So this is something I have uh, just realized relatively recently, um, it's an important um, thing to note, I think. If you're, if you're a big fish in a small pond, you won't be doing your best work. So find a bigger pond. Surround yourself with creative people and invite their criticism. And there, once again, is that exercise I'd invite you to do after, after this presentation. Thank you. Uh, this image, like the first one is the source was the deep dream generator. Uh, this one's also in the style of Starry Night, but with birds and fish. <laughs> um, so I'd be happy to take questions now. All right. So there's a, uh, there's a, live Q&A feature in, in your browser. You're welcome to use that to, to uh, post any questions. Thanks for the question, Alexis. Um, what are you most excited about happening in the tech space going into the next five years? Uh, good question. Um, uh, 
Uh, I am most excited about reinforcement learning. Um, it's it's a way from it's a way from applications at the moment. Uh, it's it's the, still the early stages uh, where it's it's um, sort of still fairly experimental. I think that to me is the most exciting thing. Uh, computers teaching themselves from scratch to do interesting tasks. Uh, right now, it's really confined to game playing. Um, the many many other applications. It may not be five years. It may be more like ten years. But but we I might be surprised. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Uh, Brittany is asked, how do you carve out time for creativity when bogged down by deliverables? Huh. Well, um, so, so I would say uh, the, the deliverable should be something where you, you can be creative. Uh, I think the, the work of life uh is it is the work that you are you are doing uh i think um it it would be a mistake to separate separate that uh um so as much as possible i'd encourage you Brittany, to 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 find deliverables uh or create your own deliverables that are uh, in line with with your creative uh aspirations um, nearly, in fact, Alexis has also asked that you seem to be a big book reader. <laughs> Are you planning to write a book of my own? I wrote a PhD thesis and that uh, cured me for quite a while of the desire to write a, a, another book. Um, I um, I might one day. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Um, um, uh, I, I might. Um, in my retirement, I that's probably what I'll, I'll do. I'll write books. Um, uh, Angela, uh, in fact, Neely's asked. Um, that was amazing. Well, thank you. Uh, what do you? What would you suggest for people who are more doers than creative folks? Do we need to find our creativity? Hmm. Um, I think. Um, uh, I, I put up a, a slide of Rosalind Franklin. Who was involved in the discovery of DNA? She was very much a doer. Um, her doing was driven, though, by by inspiration, by by her. She, she knew she was onto something. Uh, so, so I think um, the the um, I, I I wouldn't divide people into doers and creatives. I, I think that's that's a false dichotomy. I think we all have the capacity to be creative and and um, people who are in creative fields also need to do. There's a lot of just, uh, just hard, hard work, toil involved in, in creative work as well. So I, I wouldn't draw a distinction there. Thanks for your question, Neely. Um, Laurie has asked, how do you engage with your inner child? Have you restarted any of the activities I mentioned? Um, have they helped with new ideas? Uh, I um, put put aside the field of machine learning for a while. When it became popular, I uh, I became le less interested in it for a while, and I became really only interested in it again uh, when I reengaged with some of those earlier projects. So trying to um, apply reinforcement learning using deep learning models to to some of those earlier problems I I was thinking about as a child. So that's one way to to um, kind of tap into inspiration for, for something um, which has been dormant in you for a while. All right, we have the one minute left. Uh, um, so Angela's asked, which programming language is the most powerful to learn today and why? Uh, theoretically, they're all equivalent. Uh, it doesn't matter that much. I would start with Python. And I work with uh, a company started Python Chalmers and um, and Python's an excellent language that we teach for for almost all purposes. So that's a good place to start. Thanks, Angela. Um, so uh, um, Elizabeth has asked, very positive and look very innocent. Oh, thank you very much. All right, <laughs> thank you for the comment. There. Um, all right, so I think that's that's about all we have time for. So thank you very much.
and uh, please. So you can go to a break now, and there'll be a presentation afterwards. Okay, thank you.